Arizona, a state bequeathed with some of the most stunning landscapes in the world and enriched with a biological diversity that would leave any budding naturalist in a state of awe. The Grand Canyon State is a haven for herpetofauna, and fortunately a good friend of mine, Matt, who happens to be a naturalist partial to reptiles and amphibians, and has lived in Tucson, Arizona for the last couple of years, offered to introduce us to several biotic communities reliable for herps. Before visiting Matt and focusing on southern Arizona reptiles and amphibians, we spent half our week's vacation exploring central and northern Arizona. This part of our trip was dedicated to family hikes and of course the endless scenery, although several common species of lizards were frequently encountered. There was however one notable lizard find I'd like to share, and this occurred near the Glen Canyon Dam while hiking the Hanging Garden Trail. The species was a chuckwalla, one of which I encountered years before in Death Valley, and I was thrilled to be reunited with one of my favorite reptiles. These large lizards are rock crevice dwellers, inhabiting boulder piles and rock strewn mountainsides. What is particularly neat about chuckwallas is that when threatened, they will retreat into crevices and inflate themselves with air, wedging their bodies tight and protected in their rocky fortress. After the chuckwaller encounter, I was eager to get to Southeast Arizona. Unfortunately, en route from Sedona, Highway 17 was shut down for a couple of hours, and we almost missed our first evening out in the field. But we arrived in the Tucson area just in time to meet Matt for a Sonoran Desert night excursion and only a short distance from the car, a nice looking desert spiny lizard was there to greet us right at the trailhead. Aptly named, these large lizards have pointed overlapping scales, and although considered diurnal, this guy was probably taking advantage of the cooler evening temperatures. Soon after we encountered the desert spiny lizard, numerous red spotted toads were popping up, distracting me just long enough that upon seeing our first snake, a juvenile western diamondback rattlesnake, I accidentally filmed in time-lapse, resulting in, poof, there it goes. Fortunately, only minutes later, I was able to capture proper footage of a long-nosed snake, the highlight find for the night. This nocturnal species is a constrictor and will feed on lizards, especially whiptails, snakes and their eggs, small mammals, and grasshoppers. Rounding out our night hike included this coach's spadefoot toad and two other neat finds, several whip scorpions and a female wolf spider and her offspring. The following morning we left the Tucson area and headed to a moderately elevated desert grassland and only minutes after we exited our vehicles we were greeted with two or three species of lizards scurrying about and a green toad found under artificial cover, an amphibian I was really hoping to see. Okay, so the highlight of the morning and one that topped my bucket list was found not far from a shallow pool of water teeming with triops and the species was a Mexican hognose. Now I particularly wanted to encounter one of these snakes in the wild because I have these beloved western hognose as pets. After photographing and filming this reptile gem, we walked a mere 30 feet and found an ornate box turtle. Now I have a soft spot for box turtles and was delighted to be able to compare and contrast this western variety with that of the eastern box turtle, a species I am quite familiar with. By late morning it was becoming too hot for herps, so we left the desert grassland behind and headed for higher elevations in the nearby mountains, where cooler temperatures and hopefully a different assortment of animals would be there to greet us. The hike Matt chose for us followed a beautiful mountain creek surrounded by a forest dominated by sycamores, junipers, oaks, and pines. I was enjoying the scenery and even goofing off, thinking that this day really couldn't get any better, only to have Matt find two black-tailed rattlesnakes basking together right next to the trail ahead of us. By the time Matt led us back to the snakes, only one could be located, but one was certainly good enough for me. These large rattlesnakes have such stunning coloration and reminded me of yellow-faced timber rattlesnakes back home. Well, this was an extra lucky spot because as Matt was backing up, allowing me room to capture footage, he startled a rock rattlesnake just 20 feet away. And I was grateful that this sometimes skittish snake settled down into a content coil as I went back and forth between it and the blacktail. This smallish mountain rattlesnake, averaging only about 2 feet, mainly feeds on centipedes and lizards. 
Okay, so day two in southeast Arizona. Our main target was another montane rattlesnake species, the Arizona ridge nose. Our hike followed a creek flowing down through a steep forested canyon, and it wasn't long before we encountered our first notable herp, the canyon tree frog, another amphibian I was hoping to find on this trip. These frogs are superb climbers and are often found basking on rocks like this near creeks. Although we ended up finding a second canyon tree frog, the remainder of the day was uneventful herp-wise, despite hours exploring prime montane snake habitat. Thankfully, there was plenty of other flora and fauna to be appreciated, so overall I considered the day successful, despite the growing disappointment of not finding a ridge nose as we began our hike out of the canyon. When we were about a mile from the trailhead, to my astonishment, I received this text from my daughter, who, along with the rest of the family, left Matt and I hours earlier to do a shorter hike before heading to the base of the canyon to wait for us. This is a foam pic my son took of the rattlesnake as originally found on the edge of the trail, and they were able to confirm that it was indeed a ridge nose by consulting a reliable Arizona reptile and amphibian field guide that Matt had lent us just the day before. The best part of the story, and one that I am very grateful for, is that my family followed the snake until it crawled partly under a rock and made sure it stayed put until Matt and I arrived over an hour later. This is a classic example that when it comes to herping, luck is often a major factor. The following morning, which began our last full day in Arizona, we once again went for a hike in the Sonoran Desert. And keeping with the theme, our first notable herp was found only minutes into our hike, a juvenile desert night snake found in a piece of rotting wood. And then only 15 minutes later, Matt found a western diamondback rattlesnake and a regal horn lizard hanging out together under the same Palo Verde tree. I won't even try to be articulate here. This is just the coolest lizard I have ever seen in the wild. By the time I was through photographing the regal horn lizard, it was getting hot and the window to find any more herps was closing. But Matt wanted to take us up a nearby wash to test our luck a little bit further. A few hundred feet up the wash, we encountered dozens of butterflies attracted to a puddle of water. And also attracted to the precious moisture was a black-necked garter snake that Matt nearly stepped over. Now, I know I sound like a broken record, but this handsome snake was also a species I was hoping to see on this trip. And this was such a nice way to conclude a memorable week, the highlights of which I enjoyed sharing with you, a wider audience. I should point out that some of our herp success can be attributed to the fact that we visited Arizona during the monsoon season. So if you are planning a trip to the desert southwest with reptiles and amphibians on your mind, choose late summer for your visit. Before I let you go, I wanted to recommend a fascinating place to visit if you find yourself in Arizona that is not only reptile related, but a fun place to explore for the, well, quote, entire family. And that is the Navajo Dinosaur Tracks. Located 30 miles east of the Grand Canyon, there is no admission, although a Navajo guide will be on site to offer a short tour, and tips are encouraged. On the short hike, you will see up close and personal dozens if not hundreds of dinosaur tracks formed from the early Jurassic period approximately 200 million years ago and belonging to several different species. And yes, the tracks are real and have been verified by paleontologists from Northern Arizona University. Well, that is a wrap, folks. Thanks for joining me in Arizona. If you like this video, well, please consider subscribing. Thank you. We'll have to add blood in post, so this, <laughs> no, but this really hurts. Your tan line. Holy shit. That's what you notice? Yes. Thanks for you your consent. You got so, <laughs> so lucky. There's a few